Hey, when everybody talks about uh, volcanoes, everybody wants to talk about lava. So today we're going to talk about lava. So the hazards is lava flow. So let's talk about lava today. Okay, all right, my pin's not working. There it is. Flows, also how long they are, different kinds of lava flows. So that's where we're headed, okay? Okay, so a couple of words here we want to talk about. Geo words here for this uh, particular podcast. A lava flow, viscosity. Pyroclastic flow in a lahar. There'll be a couple more we'll talk about later too. Here's just such a cool picture of a lava flow. You just can see the, the cool uh, shots. Um, this is actually what we call a lava flow that's not very viscous. We kind of alluded to that in the last podcast. The lava flow, it's flowing freely, even though it kind of looks like it's all sticky. This has got a low viscosity. And um, because it is um, flowing freely, it's not as thick as some lava flows. It kind of looks thick, and, but it, it can be much thicker. So this has a low viscosity. Uh, we'll talk about higher ones that have higher viscosity too. Now let's just, uh, here's a bunch of text. You don't need to copy down all of this text. But just some interesting things. Lava flows are one of the most common things that people think of when it comes to volcanoes. Remember that lava is magma at the surface. That's important to know, magma at the surface. It is melted rock that when it cools becomes igneous rock, typically basalt. That's the most common. It destroys, so uh, those are some things I'm kind of underlying the key com points. They destroy everything in their path, but they often move slow enough that people can move themselves out of the way. So that's a good thing. Lava flows faster, faster when it's hot, so hot makes it flow fast or when it's less silica, we'll talk about that, we did actually last time, or when it's on a steeper slope, a mountain, right, steeper slope. Okay, there are two basic types of lava flows. This lava flows are thicker, so they flow slower, and they have either more silica or they're cooler. Pajone flows are thinner, and they flow faster. They have either less silica or they are faster. So there's some things to keep in mind as we uh, talk about lava flows. You probably want to pause the video to get this text down. Some cool lava flows there. Some more it's solidified here in this picture. We see the lava has solidified. It's probably flowing underneath there. It cools. Of course, the surface is hot. This is flowing. Kind of weird to think of this particular flow flowing, or this uh, this is probably moving down this hill, so to speak, and it's flowing underneath. But the, it kind of has a shell at the top, and that shell is because it's actually solidified already. But the underneath it has not. And here's another one, and kind of a, a classic picture of of a, of a woman. Um, where you have a lava flow down here, this particular mountain. Now let's watch a short video clip about lava flows. There are different types of lava. One is very fluid. It has the consistency of thick cream. It is called pohoihoi lava. Another lava type is thick and chunky and usually slow moving. It is called a'a -a lava. In some places, the lava slows to a stop, hardening into black rock as it cools. In other places, the lava doesn't stop, reaching the ocean. Here, you sense a battle as fire meets water. Steam explosions are common as the lava explodes as it hardens. This unusual lava flow is called fire hose lava. At night, the explosions take on an eerie quality. Beneath the water, Lava quickly crusts over and then cracks open again, like the egg of an alien creature. This kind of lava is known as pillow lava because of its pillowy shape and has seldom been photographed. Back on the surface, new shorelines form under clouds of hissing steam. 
What has been destruction now becomes construction as new land is formed and the big island of Hawaii is now a little bit bigger. That was cool. That was very cool. Now let's talk about viscosity. What the heck is viscosity? Well, viscosity is the thickness of a liquid. So if I here have some maple syrup right here, and as it's pouring, it is a thicker uh, consistency. So the thicker consistency makes something more viscous. Or let's take a look at the text down here. It's basically the thickness of a liquid. Like I said, the more viscous a liquid, the slower it will move. This less viscous, thus, I should say thus. Thus, less viscous liquids move faster. So with a lava, that's what we're talking about, right? The viscosity of the lava controls how fast it moves. Slower moving lava has a higher viscosity and are typically cooler. Think about cold pancake syrup. Cold pancake syrup slows slow, where hot pancake syrup slows fast. Get the idea? OK, that's our understanding of viscosity. Now, pyroclastic flows are probably one of the most dramatic things in a volcano. They are unbelievably powerful and, and deadly, actually. Actually, if you look at this picture, sadly, there are houses and stuff on there. You can kind of see down there. Um, you can see some kind of a, of, a, of a dwelling. Hopefully, the people left before this happened, because they are about to die if they're there. OK, but here's what they are. They are loosely translate to fire fragment flows. That's what, the, that's what that means. Pyro, fire, and then, uh, yeah. They glow at night and have a very high temperature, very high temperature. They are very fast moving and very damaging and deadly. Very few people have ever survived this. There's a few ones that's not a, very, very few. In fact, there's a kind of a cool story, and in a bad sense, I guess. There was a pyroclastic flow in this mountain that it, when it crashed, or when it, it erupted, and um, islands 30 miles away were destroyed by the pyroclastic flow. Um, and like two people survived kind of deal of, of thousands. Um, and they're made of hot gases, ash, and rocks. It, it heats up the air so much that the air uh, is so hot that it, you know, people suffocate because of the heat is so hot or it just burns their lungs kind of a thing. So that's pretty cool. I got interrupted. Sorry, so I'm not sure exactly where I'm at. Hey, here's a picture of a pyroclastic flow. Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. Basically, you get just hot gas, air, um, hot uh, volcanic ash and air uh, coming in an explosion, and it's unbelievable. This was from uh, a National Geographic picture. Unbelievable. You know, I think I've got a video clip. I'll, I'll pause myself, and if I've got one. Krakatau's eruptions grow stronger. Its victims grow desperate. I heard my husband say in despair, there is the knife. I will cut all our wrists, then we shall be sooner released from our suffering. Before the knife is found, a volcanic firestorm finds the bearings first. I felt a heavy pressure throwing me to the ground. Then it seemed as if all the air was being sucked away and I could not breathe. The last thing I saw was the ash being pushed up through the cracks in the floorboards like a fountain. The Bay of Rinks are assaulted by a blast of superheated ash. But how could it ever reach them from Krakatau, some 25 miles away? Discovering the answer sends Dr. Sigurdsson over the edge. Yeah, I hear you. It's a very loose material that tends to crumble uh, underfoot or above your head and uh, produces a lot of dust and dirt but uh, the rewards are great because there's a lot of information that you access that you couldn't possibly get at the end in any other way the volcanologist finds an economy sized layer of ash the smoking gun of a phenomenon called pyroclastic flow today however the only threat it poses to Heraldo is a dent on his hard hat from loose debris. But 200 years ago, this volcanic drift was a superheated mass screaming down the flanks of Krakatoa. It'll knock you over, it'll incinerate you. It's total death, very, very suddenly. And that would then accumulate in a matter of hours up to this thickness that we have here of over, over 300 feet in the, in the highest parts of these cliffs. Pyroclastic flows occur when ash, pumice, and gas overflow a volcano's rim and turn into a ground-hugging avalanche from hell. Pyroclastic flows 
can be considered the nuclear arsenal of explosive volcanoes. The internal temperature of the flow is usually in excess of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So these flows are going at more than 100 miles an hour. So you can imagine being hit by a hurricane and a furnace at the same time. The accounts of the uh, experience of the Bering family are truly amazing. And there's a graphic description as to how the hot ash was shooting up between the floorboards and burning the people inside the hut. I noticed that the door was ajar, and I forced myself through the opening. The hot bite of the pumice pricked like needles. Of the 3,000 natives caught in the open, 1,000 die. The rest lie in shock from burns and blisters. So, obviously, that is a uh, high temperature ash that cannot have fallen from the sky. This had to be material that had traveled over the land surface or at a very high velocity and retained sufficient heat to burn people to death. Accounts of this firestorm begin to make sense when compared to modern eruptions. In 1980, a pyroclastic flow careened down the side of Mount St. Helens, claiming some 50 lives. Yet horrible as it was, the flow traveled only four miles from the crater. So let's get our heads around this. If pyroclastic flows only travel a few miles over land, how could one travel over 25 miles of water? I mean, give me a break. You put fire out with water. But that's why the discovery of the flow on Sertong Island is such a cliffhanger for Sigurdsson and Kerry. There might be something here that could indicate a pyroclastic flow that travels over water. That's because the size of this one is so massive, it may have written its own set of road rules. When it flowed into the water or over the water, it didn't see the ocean. It didn't care. It just plowed through the ocean, retaining high temperature and its high violent state. The theory of ocean-borne flows is partly confirmed by the massive eruption on the island of Montserrat in 1997. Although it travels less than a mile, this pyroclastic flow manages to move over water. We also think that because the flow is so hot, it vaporizes some of the water surface. It produces a little cushion of steam, much like a hovercraft goes over the surface of the water. Unlike volcanic explosions, the flows are relatively quiet, giving little warning to those in their path. In a day filled with unspeakable horrors, Mrs. Bayering now endures the cruelest of all. Krakatau's wrath claims the life of her youngest child. Too numb to cry, a mother sees this tragic death as a bittersweet blessing. Thank God, this child is at least put out of his agony. When rumors spread that a nearby volcano may also erupt, the bearings hit the trail again. That any horror could surpass the torture they've endured seems unthinkable. But in fact, new and far greater threats are in motion. We know that the pyroclastic flows had a major impact in Sumatra, where they burned to death at least a thousand people. Uh, but uh, the death toll is clearly mostly attributed to the tsunamis. Spawned by Krakatau's rage, monsters are about to rise from the sea. And I'll throw that into it. It's really pretty fascinating. <laughs> 